Welcome to Marafaya, the show that dives into the climate crisis in Belize. I'm Andre, and Digna is out today because she's Baka Bush, working with the Friends of Conservation and Development on their Scarlet Macaw monitoring program. She'll be back next week where she'll share some of her experiences during the week-long research trip. On today's episode, we first have a short interview with poet Kyla Gentle before getting into a discussion I recorded with several members of the Belize Fishermen's Cooperative Association regarding why they opposed the gillnet ban in a follow-up to episode 3. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, you should check it out. Kyla is a poet and storyteller born and raised in Belize City, Belize. She picked up the craft of writing at the age of 12 and since then has never let go. Even when studying at Kaishang Medical University in Taiwan, she never forgot her one true passion. And now she hopes to one day become a full-time author. Crossroads, a collection of poems, is her debut book. When's the book being released, Kyla? It's being released on May 18th, so next week, Tuesday. Awesome. And welcome to the show. Thank you so much for filling in Digna's uh, empty seat for today. And thank you for having me. This is my first podcast, so it's a bit nerve-wracking, but I'm excited. Don't worry about it. Uh, you just have to talk, and anytime we don't talk, I'll take that part out of it. So we're, <laughs> we're fine. So Kyla, a little bit from your bio here says that you picked up writing from 12. What has been your focus with writing, and uh, what drew you to it? So when I was about 12, my grandma gave me my first ever novel. It was um, The Chronicles of Narnia. And that was kind of my first glimpse into the world of writing and fantasy and, and that kind of stuff. And after a while, I just like, I don't even, I'm not even sure how I started, but I just know that I started writing these small stories I think back then, vampires were the big thing. So I started writing stories about vampires. And I also started writing poems, um, just trying to make things rhyme and that kind of stuff. And it just I just never stopped after I started. For a while, it was kind of, I liked the idea of being able to live various lives through the characters that I, I was writing. And so for me, for a while, writing was mainly just escapism and being able to create worlds from scratch and being able to live like a million lives in one. Um, and it wasn't until I was a lot older that I more I leaned in more to the art of poetry. Like I went to the open mic night at the 501 Hub with the um, 501 Poet. And I felt so like inspired when I was there that I said to myself, well, I, I should probably try and take my poetry more seriously. And in the process of doing that, I realized that poetry was kind of this way for me to channel my emotions, which is something that I struggle with, sharing and being open and vulnerable. And as I began to discover this more vulnerable side of me, I began to love poetry even more and that is essentially what's brought me to where I am now where I'm finally actually publishing a book of poetry um, but that's my writing journey in kind of that's that's the the yeah, that's the gist of it. No, that sounds great. Uh, we actually met at a spoken word five hundred one reading. I remember. Yeah, <laughs> I remember. Um, you, you, you said you liked my poem, and I was like, oh my god, because I, I think I heard you reading yours first, and I was like, oh my god, he likes my poem. Like, like that was, that was a great night. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a really good night. I think uh, I heard a lot of people for the first time then. So. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad to be able to continue our conversation here, and I'm so impressed by your the work you've done to put together a collection. Can you tell us anything more specifically about this collection you did? Uh, what's its origins? Does it have any sort of thematic uh, co- um, narrative to it? Or Crossroads began as it was a lot smaller than it is now because. It was meant to be an entry for a chapbook competition for button poetry. Um, and it didn't win, of course. And after, you know, getting over my disappointment and that kind of stuff, I looked at the poems again and I said that there's like there's something beautiful in, in this collection because they, they were mostly poems about mainly a lot of them were about my my struggles with mental health and learning to love and accept myself 
And I saw it and I thought that, you know, this this isn't that bad. This is actually a pretty good collection. And it I feel like it's something that could help someone if they read it and realize like, hey, I'm, I'm not alone, you know, like this person is going through similar things as, as I am and I find comfort in this and I resonate with this. So I began to add more poems as I went along. I, I believe it been about two or three years since I started adding poems and when I reached a point where I said I have enough poems to kind of craft a story out of this I was like well why not publish it myself so the book is broken up into three parts essentially the first part is more so about the the struggle aspect of it the depression and self-hate and the second part is about love and heartbreak. And the third part of the book is more about the healing and the growth that I experienced thanks to the struggles and the heartbreak and everything else that, that came before. Um, essentially, what I wanted to do is paint this picture that we, we have our dark moments and we have our dark parts, but... Um, through that struggle, we can grow and we can gain a lot from it. And that is mostly what I really want people who pick up this book and read it to, to see. It sounds amazing. And I feel very fortunate in that I was able to read a early beta copy of the book. And I'm excited for a lot of people to get to access it in the near future. Uh, where can people access Crossroads? So for now, it's going to be available on Amazon in both ebook and printed formats. I'm also um, buying a, a couple of author copies and I'm shipping it to Belize. That way people could contact me if they want to order it without going through the, the hassle of Amazon. Because I do realize that that's kind of one of the, the I guess you could say, the struggles that writers in Belize have to go through it's getting your books out amazon is the easiest route but it's not necessarily the most convenient they can get it either on amazon or from me personally where can they contact you you can find me on i'm on instagram at shiabanba that's x-i-a-b-a-n-b-a and i am also on facebook at Kyla A. Gentle, or you could contact me at my number on WhatsApp, 631-1386. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And you're going to stick around with us for another segment, yeah? Yes. Great. So we're just going to hop right into that one. Last time on the show, Digna and I introduced a new segment called A Moment of Gratitude, A Minute of Rage. In that segment, Digna and I will be regularly exchanging one minute of gratitude for one moment of gratitude for a minute of rage in an effort to balance the despair that the climate crisis brings to our lives with the gratitude for all that remains and all that we're fighting for. So since last time I did the minute of rage, uh, this time I will take on the moment of gratitude and then Kyla will follow up with her minute of rage. What am I grateful for this week? I think I uh, have been especially grateful for the people I live with, my sister and my nephews and my mom. You know, we have our conflicts, but I really just feel so lucky. And I think they're so sweet a lot of the time in ways that just make life make life life, I guess. So that's my moment of gratitude for me. I can definitely relate with that and being grateful for the, the people around you. Um, despite the, the downside sometimes, like they're, they're really a, a blessing. So I understand. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and, uh, you know, we do have, like I said, we have conflict, but I think I realized after, you know, having lived with a lot of people in the 10 years I lived away, that uh, it's not... It's not always that you find a way to understand each other and give each other space and make life work. So, yeah, yeah I just wanted to give a you know shout out to them, uh, my mom and my sister, especially because they I think they listen to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Give us your moment of minute of rage so we can uh, yeah. we can move away from the mush of feelings. <laughs> OK, so this is my, my minute of rage. It's a poem I wrote last year around the time of the Australia bushfires. It's called Red. Red. 
red. It's a thousand burning suns all around me. It's the sunrise and the sunset and everything in between these days. Fear coursing through my veins, racing, burning, alongside bitter rage. Why has no one done a thing? We can't outrun this burning, this disaster. We cannot outrun this red because there is nowhere left to run. And soon there will be nowhere left to run. Nothing left to do because thoughts and prayers evaporate the minute they touch this blaze this red, this catastrophe. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much for reading that. That fire really stuck with me as a very scary premonition of, of things to come if we don't get our act together as humans. So thank you. It was rage eloquently and beautifully shared. So thank you so much for, for sharing that poem. Yeah, no problem. I thought it would be fitting for the, the podcast since it is focused around environmental issues and that like you that the the forest fires is something that's embedded in my memory it was i i remember seeing a a photo of a kangaroo like trying to run away from the fires and that is what like inspired me to to write this yeah it was there was a lot of horrific imagery then and um you know the world as it is there continues to be a lot of horrific imagery coming out um day by day yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the on the show. We have a little bonus at the end of the episode. Uh, Kyla will be reading one other poem for y'all. So stick around to the end and right after the credits and you'll hear Kyla one more time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Poetry means so much to me and it, it really is the thing that allows a lot of the work on environmental issues to be endurable. Yeah. It helps you endure poetry. So I'm excited to have you on as my f- first poet and Hopefully, definitely not the last. Last time I discussed this topic, I was a firm supporter of the Gilnet ban, believing it was in the best interest of marine life. After the conversation you're about to hear, I've changed my mind considerably. Not only were the fishers able to explain to me why the Gilnet is an essential tool of their trade, irreplaceable by other methods, they also exposed to me some of the inconsistencies of the ban's execution that leave me with questions about how such a instruments are enacted and who gets to determine policy change in Belize. I'll let you all listen and decide for yourselves. I'm sitting here with the Belize Fishermen's Cooperative Association. Hi, good afternoon. Sydney, I'm Sidney Fuller, the, Belize, the Executive Director of the Belize Fishermen's Cooperative Association. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Armando Ramirez. I'm the chairperson for the BFC, also a third-generation fisher. My name is Andy Jones. I'm just a fisherman fighting for my gill net so that I can survive. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Paola Coleman of fisherwoman from Dangrigatong and I'm here because I'm not happy about what is happening with the gillnet situation. We need an answer about it as soon as possible because our livelihood is at stake. Good afternoon, this uh, was a cool man uh, there because well, I live off of my net and well, that's the only thing I know to do and I depend on that. All my life I do that and um, only thing I can do is fishing. Good afternoon, Vonetta Dawson Fisher of Dangriga. Good afternoon, my name is Steve Fuller. I'm from Belize City. I am the spokesperson for the Belize Central Fishers. Good afternoon, my name is Alan Byrne. I'm a gillnet fisher from 1975. And um, I just want to say that uh, it's a good thing that we are here because we need to get our ideas out to the public because the other side has, has put out a lot of bad information and we need to counteract that. Thank you. Thanks all of you for being here with me today. So um, Mr. Burns, I think you hit it off uh, well right there. There's a lot of disinformation. What are some aspects of this situation that you feel may have been rep- misrepresented in the media or misrepresented by those parties that were involved in initiating the Gilnet ban? To answer your question, some time ago, about a month ago, we had a, um, a press conference <clears throat> in which I made certain statements that is well worth re- repeating. And one of them is that Oceana has been saying a lot of things that is not true. That Gilnet kills small fish, they kill turtle, they kill malanti, they destroy the reef. Now what happened is a Gilnet is made from fishing line. 40 pound test fishing line. And um, the size mesh that we use is four inches. 
which means that the fish has to have a circumference of eight inches around the gills for it to be caught in the net. Anything less than that, the fish will escape from the me through the mesh because the mesh is too big to, ho to hold it. Now, those fish that are caught in the gill net are mature fish that have already spawned at least twice. Spawn means they have um, reproduced and replenish the sea with its eggs. So when we take a fish from, the, from, from a gill net, that fish had replenished the sea with its species a thousand times. But not all will survive. Let's say if it were to 50 to survive from each fish that we take. That means that that fish has replenished the sea with 50 of its species. So how come this is a destructive gear. This is sustainable. Secondly, a gillnet, they say gillnet use, is used right throughout the air. Gillnet can only be used a certain time in the night, certain nights of the month. Five days prior to the full moon, the night of the full moon, and five nights in succession going past the full moon. That means that during that time, we will not be able to use a gill net. The reason being, because of the moonlight, the fish see the net and will avoid being caught in the net. So then, that in itself is sustainable because we have to avoid catching fish during, that, during that, those times in the night. So only half, so if we were to say we can only fish half of the month, it means we fish six months out of the air. What is unsustainable of, about that? And a next lie that they say is that gillnet kill malati. Now, remember I told you earlier that, the ma that a gillnet is made, the, the webbing of a gillnet is made from 40 pound test fishing line. Now, a malanti is about, a bull malanti, full grown bull malanti is about 12 feet in length and has about a circumference of not less than eight feet at its widest part. Now that's a powerhouse. Now if a malanti comes close to a net and wants to pass, all it has to do is make one flap of its tail and it will tear that net to, to ribbons. So there is no way in hell a gill net can catch a malanti. Now a lie that they put is that whenever the, the, um, the tourist boat kill manatees with the propeller and a, and a dead manatee is washed up on the beach. And you see the big scars and the, and the big chops. And what they do, they take a net, a rope net. They are net made from rope to sling the manatee to dispose of the carcass. And so they, they roll it in, a, in this big rope net and then they use a, a, um, a backhoe to hoist it and put it in the, in the, in the, in the pan of a pickup truck or whatever to take it away. And what happened is they take photograph of that and say, see, that's a net, that's a fishing gear. That is what, what is killing the Malantes, which is downright dishonest and irresponsible. I appreciate what you said there right now about uh, the misrepresentation of the gill net and its impact on various ecosystems. One thing we spoke about before this interview was how that is in part due to the representation of gill nets we're getting to see in the media in terms of the visual modeling that depict various animals getting caught up in the gill net. At this point in time, gill nets are being referred to as walls of death. What do you ascribe this perception of gill nets to? Yeah, here in Belize, we don't do industrialized uh, fish, commercial fishing of, of whatever kind. You know, our, our gill net is, is really, really small. I could recall those good old years when we go and pick up our net, we will always find some tremendous holes I mean, the size of this table. I mean, we knew right away what it was. You know, we have never slaughtered a manatee. What, and if you look at the videos that Oshana is playing on these ads, they have a, a rope. I don't know, maybe it's uh, three eighths of an inch thick or, or, or one eighth. I don't know, but it's literally a rope. And the, the, the kind of net that these people use out, out there, I mean, we're talking about miles of net. Here in Belize, it's just 300 meters. Those include the three pieces of net, right? So each piece of net have one 100 meter. So our, our fishing system here in Belize is, is, is like, let me put it this way, Belize have one of the best artisanal fishing practices in, in, in the region. One, because Belize, if Belize were a country that would export laws, 
it will be a filthy rich country. You know, we have laws for every single thing. You know, so we are we are top of the game when it comes to to laws. You know, I, I'm, I'm 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 glad for that. I'm happy for that. But we are reached to a point where the NGOs are taking over the country, where they come and they dictate to the government. And we have governments. I mean, we have people who are leaving us who have not a clue of this industry, right? So we have ministers who become ministers of fisheries who maybe be, may, their background may be agriculture, their background may be um, baking bread, their background may be anything else but fishing, right? So how can how can these people make wise, um, sound decision for for this industry? You know, so our fishing industry here with Gilnet, it, it's 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 healthy, it's environmentally friendly. And what Gilnet, what tourism has done in Belize in 10 years, Gilnet has never done in 100 years in terms of destruction. You go down south, the amount of, of, of dredging, the amount of landfilling, the, 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 the thousands of acres that have been filled. I mean, these were natural marine habitat, you know. But when you fill that because of tourism or in the name of tourism, you have just destroyed not just the next generation or not just uh, some larva or some little minnows. You basically have wiped out a complete geographic area of this country where it will never be a marine habitat for the next generation. So now, with COVID, island tour guides who fight against fishers, when COVID came, you know what happened to them? They were jobless. They gone back to commercial fishing. Fisherman still survive. What I'm saying, beyond fisherman, we have a damn healthy commercial fishing industry, including our gillnets. And I see that what tourism has done in 10 years, gillnet has never done in 100 years in terms of destruction. I have seven children. This net that's a wall of debt is not a wall of debt to our family. It's a wall of food. If a government can come in with a stroke of a pen, and they turn what I do legally to feed my family without having to beg anyone. I don't have anyone in Punta Gorda that can say I'm begging for money, I'm begging for this, or I'm begging for that. I go and I do my fishing. I catch $200 a week, maybe sometimes less, maybe a little bit more. I turn that money around, I put it into food. This wall of debt is wall of food to my family. If these people can see the look on my children's faces as we pick up the nets, they're happy. Whenever we catch something, everyone is happy. Everyone sees that we're going to be buying food, we're going to be buying this, we're going to be buying something for the family. When the nets are empty, everybody's face is sad. But they understand. This is reality. Sometimes you catch, sometimes you don't. But the reality of this wall of debt, it's going to be a wall of debt. If I can't figure out how to produce money to buy necessary goods for my family, personal hygiene, I try to raise my own food, I try to do hunting on the side, I do beekeeping, I'm doing everything I can to survive. The nets were very important. Now I'm scared to go and set them. I'm scared that they're going to take them away. I don't know what the lawsuit is going to bring, but the reality is... I need my net. I'm still setting them every now and then, but the government has done, because of Oceana, they've taken over our government, they've hijacked the government, and now Oceana is dictating what we can and cannot do to survive. Oceana has not offered me one penny for my nets. Oceana doesn't even acknowledge that I exist. Now, with the stroke of a pen, I am now a criminal. Yeah, and to more, you know, in line of what you also asked, how important the Gilnet is to us is because everything has a season. And there's a time, for instance, um, when the rainy season come. I mean, that's the season for the snook, you know. And you can't just handline snook how you want or strike snook how you want. Net is the ideal thing. You know, you want to catch cones? The ideal thing is a fin and mass. You want to catch lobster? You have to have your fin and your mass and your hammer and your trap or your, your, your lobster shield. No, you want to catch... Um, Pelagic species, you know, kingfish, mackerel, jacks, you need gillnet, you know. You want to catch your snook in your rainy season, you have to use your gillnet, you know. And um, the way we grew up is that every month is like you fall into something else. So by the time you come back again to the first month you start, everything has had enough time to recoup. Now something that is very interesting but at the same time like it, it, it's outright dumb is that here we have in Belize like these NGOs and the government wants to ban the gillnet. Failing to realize that you just put out hundreds of people out of job. But get this, 
Who would want to buy a piece of land just so that the neighbor could get the benefit and you can't get the benefit? Who, who would do that in their right mind? If you invest in a piece of property or in a house, it's because you want to have an income from it, right? So now you have these people saying, let's put a ban on whatever. So now you put a ban on the gillnet, down south, we are borders with Guatemala, right? And Belize doesn't have a fence or a wall to stop the Belizean fish to go into Guatemala. So when you ban down south, where I come from, right, PG, we have a marine reserve tied. I haven't used net, net for the past 15 years. Do I want to use it? Hell yes, because that's how I grew up. So no, I, we can't use net down there. So all this fish on the teal, I always use this as a joke, but it's a serious thing. All the fish, the PG on the teal has Guatemala. You know, they all come and go. You know those people? Those people are getting like, I mean, at least a hundred thousand pound of fish in 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 a space of so three some months. Some would say um, that gillnets the, uh, are a practice. That's like yes, it was part of our cultural heritage, per month. but it's that's also something that perhaps that we need easily to move away see it, from because of could its destructive features. And benefit, now, but because we can't use the gillnet, these fish go to Guatemala. So everything that Belize government are doing along with the NGOs is what would you say to that in terms of Belizean? Why are gillnets so crucial amid a broad variety of ways in which we can catch fish? Since the closing of the lobsters season well we had the need to go on and um, set our nets for our income but unfortunately my teammates they um were got with the gill nets right for me it is unfair because we we used to fishing with it bravely brave bravely and now we feel like um we are criminals Right now, um, we have one of our vessel and our nets right here at Fisheries Department. Department. Um, from then, I am not able. We are not able to go at sea to um fishing. Um, lobster season closed. Then conch season open. Yes, but we are not finding the the product. Bec- and we have the weather from Easter. Um, there's not no like uh like what's this word um like um will for me to go out there and do something at sea right now so right now what i was doing lately is sell food home something that i thought i would never have to do but i am in this situation where i cannot do nothing so this banning of gillnet is really affecting us um we have guys that are working for us i cannot give them no job right now because of my situation right and i will not i i i could have um decided to give in my gillnets to oceana collect the money but I do not see the benefit of it in the future, so I deny that. Well, I think the net is very crucial to us as fishers. Like we said, climate change, it helps with a lot. Hurricane season, we can't dive. We can't hand fish. If you could look out at the weather, you'll see how it's stand right now. We can't sit down in the boat and do nothing. So now with the nets, like when hurricane... 10 to 20 knots they blow that the net save we we secure pan land and the net there are water so when we can dive fish or not now if they ban the net when hurricane season where we are do sit on while i will pick my house the only net feed everybody in my house because i don't want family fisher so if i not go work Nobody eat bills can pay. I know got our fish job full, you know, pan. So I say if we, we really need we need under something really valuable to us fishers for mining and we not overuse it. We not the chop and reef because then we don't have money for buy a new net every day. You understand? We can't buy and the reef the reef the the um patches then we cut up the net. We're not rich. We usually build with own ramas and wrap with net wrong that. We could damage that because they're just things where we put there like trees and so. sometimes I'll pay like a three thousand more for one single net, forget it. Well me I I land for do my own sewing and everything for make it much cheaper for me for the net. But it very expensive. Very expensive. So we really need we net it valuable to we when worse hurricane season and then it give it a longer stretch now. You see from Easter where they have weather. East time is bad for we as fishers with net. No People come with fish. fish, but we don't have the net for go go get on a fish, mom, and I not going out there. Because they don't pay insurance if we not go with self social, if we not go with self. With our set of work as well, we have to look for our own, we have to mind with self. Nobody back me up like Ocean, oh, they can insure me and my boat for go out there. And then they want to take away the insurance from me. That's our insurance. 
we see if when weather we put the net our insurance still let us see we family still I eat then know what they on the peep so make a hurry put the net so we could drink tea the man in that no fisheries officer or somebody they can catch we you understand me so we really need we net and it really valuable to we as fishers when not blue we can go there and do no diving we can dive for cows we can dive for lobster and um all the fish when not blue all the fish go to the south the south have reduce have something like a funnel everything when go in there no come out back because all the sprout and all the bait go in there and the big fish follow that because why in there is big big lake so they go go in there and live so everything we pass from Belizean coast are dried down to Guatemala and then get the benefit of it because when snapper come down when snapper mutual come down in November and December that just pass through they go right through go to Guatemala and Honduras because after we catch it there they catch it over there and the next thing when we used to, used to go to outside the reef for fishing I meet up to close to a hundred boats from Honduras the fishing there and when I go to Honduras, all the fish were co- go fire, go direct to Honduras. Honduras get the benefit of it. Right now, there was an official figure that was provided to the public about how many people had registered gillnets at the time of the ban, right? And that was based on how many people were registered between 2015 and 2018, according to them. So what you just said, Mr. Jones, is that the uh, Oceana and Fisheries, um, when they received your application your, your for registration, that that registration was never came about. Um, is that a common um, a common thing that was happening at that time and in addition to that uh, what happened to I'm do, not sure what was the exactly how to answer um, this but um, I do know that I went to the fisheries department I registered my net I, um, the fisheries men there I know they know that they helped me to string it out stretch it out measure it I filled in my applications I did everything thinking that everything was above board um, that was a couple of years ago and before this ban came into play, w- it was before the ban was into play. And when I went back and questioned about it, I never worried about it because I did everything that they said by law. They said we had to start registering it. I said, okay, good. So I registered it. I never tried to bother about it, didn't think about anything about it. When I went back to find out about it, they said they sent the paperwork to fisheries. I called over here, fisheries says we never received the paperwork. And I spoke to a gentleman in the department here, and he said, that they're getting a lot of complaints about that, where gillnet registrations were lost, were never received. They don't know what happened to them. It seems that it's a common thing that happened, and I am one of the people that got caught up in it, and I think a couple of people in this room have been caught up in that, where the, it's like Guatemala and the fishes. They go in and they don't come back out, or <laughs> applications came in and maybe Oceana is holding them for us. I'm not sure. The registration of Gilnet started in 2013. I did my registration then, and I have a copy of it. And there's nowhere on this registration it is stated that there is an expiry date. What happened in 2020, January, at the bottom of those who they cherry pick to have their um, registration of Gilnet re-registered, they put at the bottom, expired at the end of 2020, January, December 31st, 2020. Um, I was denied to have my net re-registered in 2020. And they told me that they only taking registration, uh, who did their re-registration back in 2019. But there is nowhere on this application that I have, and I have it here before me, and all other applications before me who did that are, are after me would have the same thing. There is no expiry date on that. Now, when I look at the cabinet paper it is stated for for um 2019 december of 2019 it is stated that all existing gillnets should be re-registered now the question is why is it that the fisheries department outrightly denied people or went against a decision from cabinet to get a small amount of people who 
would then have re-registered their net in 2020. I mean, <laughs> the answer is clear on that. For the money being paid is to facilitate Oceana. So those people who they knew were fighting, those were forced to be, to be um, denied that. I was one. And I'm proud to say that they did that to me because I'm going to deal with it. But there are many, many more who did their registration and was denied that. Those of you in this room, I, I believe that no, no one was one of the beneficiaries of the um, transition fees where you were... You were invited to give up your gill nets in exchange for monies that could then be used um, according to the Coalition of Sustainable Fisheries um, in order to transition into a different mode of fishing, um, into tourism or agriculture. Can you just, um, so one person touched on it a little bit earlier, but does anyone else want to say as to why they didn't feel like making that exchange was in their best interest? And also, are you familiar with anyone who has um, given up their gill nets and how that's played out for them? Yes, I got somebody who do that. Yes, he be take the money and build a long fish pot. And what they do with the fish pot, they kill a lot of small fish and a lot of them stay out of the sea. And they rotten and the wires they use. So that to me, that destroy a lot more on the net because that fishing day and night. I, I think I think one of the things that happen with Oceana is that uh, there's a few people who do commercial fishing because I mean you just can't have a commercial be a fisherman and then decide one day to walk up to an office and go get your tour guide license. You can't do that. Unfortunately, the tour guides that have a license can just walk up to that building and and walk down with a commercial fishing license, right? So these are the people who income is not 100% on commercial fishing. So they have something to fall back. So they can give up their gill net. And these are the people that Oceana have target. These are the people that Oceana talk about a lot of people, a lot of fishermen who give. These people are not fishers. If you do have a fisherman who really depend on fishing is because he have probably life really good, but he doesn't need the gill net. Or maybe it's a fisherman who, who is not using gill net at all. But any serious commercial fisherman that use gill net would never say the things on the media as Oceana are saying it or using them to say. So there's a lot of people that are tour guides who have commercial fishing license and all these people that Oceana talk about are fishers who want the ban. These are not fishers. These are tour guides. These are people who are maybe teachers or something. I know somebody's a PG who don't want teacher. Retire the collect for his pension. You know, he used gill net. He sell out the gill net just to collect. The, he just to use the situation for benefit, benefit himself. He's not really, he's not for Oceana nor for, for, for the fisherman. I think he just Oceana cherry-picked who they were going to give this money to. And I do know of... Um, one gentleman in particular that was given the money, but to be honest, I've never seen him using a gill net. I've never known him to use a gill net. He must have been able to get his gill net license somehow. And this gentleman, I've actually seen that he has received the funds. And I see that he's got now a new boat and an engine. And it just seems strange to me that it's people who are not really depending on the gill net that are getting the funds and i hear on the news i want i wonder to myself oceana is putting out so many ads these ads i i can't imagine that they're cheap those ads could be coming in handy for like my friend across the room from me her boat is now sitting in in fisheries department with her engine with her net with everything where she, before she's never had to go out and beg or cook or do anything i'm hoping the fisheries will go and give the herd some pantry or something because now they've basically delegated us into paupers. Mm -hmm. So what are we to do? What are we going to do? I mean, are we going to get in the bread line and ask for food? Or do we hold our heads up high and become, you know, we're fishermen. That's what we do. We fish. We sell our product. We're proud of doing that. We're not begging. We're not in any bread line. So Oceana, you know, they, they, they pick and choose who they want. The ads could be helping people who need food, but they use these ads, and there's quite a few of them, every day, almost, it seems. Or uh, every time I turn on my news, there's an ad about Oceana, who they're helping, and it's the same four or five people that are always on it. I don't know anyone else. And it's not benefiting us. It's not benefiting anyone. I'm wondering to myself, one minute Oceana was talking about 1.5 million, next minute they're 2 million. We don't know exactly how much money they have, Oceana should come clean. The people that they're giving the money to, state exactly how much money they have. State how much money you have left. Show the people that the money that you have is really being used for the fishermen and not going to some minister that we don't
don't know about if he passed a law at the end of the term just to get money. I'm just saying. But we don't know. Oceania should come clean with the money. State what you have and state to where it's going. What is the perceived benefit to an organization like Oceana in casting the gillnet ban? I think that Oceana I benefit is just the fact that the minute you ban, if you get this victory on gillnet banning in Belize, I believe that as an as a ED, you automatically get an individual benefit, financial compensation, because you have fought a good fight and you was victorious. Secondly, if you victorious with the banning of Gilnet, it just encourages the donors to give me more free money so that I could stay within the country and go to another step. Who knows, maybe it will be hook stick, maybe it will be lobster trap or lobster shit or something else, you know? So there is a benefit, there is a direct financial benefit to Oceana the minute they win permanently this battle. So, you know, it may not have nothing to do, even Oceana itself, even Janel Chanona, I believe she even, she doesn't believe the sermons that she's preaching. But because there is finance, you know, she's showing it all there. What was your awareness as individuals and as an organization of the Gilnet's ban taking effect? Because it was supposed to originally be taking effect in 2022 and very suddenly it got brought up to 2020. In 2019, we had the, the task force of which the Belize Fishermen Co-op Association, who represent the commercial fishers of Belize, fought to get on that task force. We finally made it, and our first meeting was in January of 2019, the 11th of, um, the 11th of January 2019. At that time, it was, it was um, the chairperson was Dr. Percival Shaw, and he reiterated that what the task force was, was all about. And I'm just going to read it from here. The chair reiterated, as stated in the past, that the main purpose of the meeting is to, in quote, develop improved measures to reduce harmful effects of gillnets and marine life end of quote we attended we had about four or five meetings and within those meetings we made it clear that we were here to run no ban they fought the other side fought um, which we were outpowered or out outnumbered by NGOs people like from the game fishers sport fishers and others but still we did a brilliant and a wonderful fight and we were able to get it more or less to how we wanted it Eventually came and there I proceeded to file action after consultation with my officials, action in the courts to see how we can have this matter addressed. The matter is now before the courts and we rely on that that we should be an, uh, um, comfortable and welcome for us and that we're looking forward to something good on that. But that's where it is for 2020. There was not much going on, but what we learned after the SI was signed that there was a coalition for sustainable fisheries which consists of NGOs, all those who were there fighting us at the task force prior, which the government has put together, um, the Mara Alliance, the um, Gay Fishers, Sport Fishers, um, Yellow Dog, Hernef, Turnif Atoll Trust, and, and others who were there. And um, they were the ones who sat down and put a paper together demanding a, a early um, ban, and which then, with discussion apparently with just the minister, he went ahead and did the ban. We in the fishing sector knew nothing, nothing of that until after the SI was signed. So it was, the rug was pulled from under us, if I may use a term for it. It was unfair to what happened, and that's why we have the matter before the court, and that's why we continue to fight to see how we can have this SI rescinded. Thank you so much for that summation of the events. That's all the questions I really had, but I would really like to open up the floor to anyone if you all have any final words you want to contribute to this discussion, anything you'd like the public to know about the ban and about what you're really wanting to happen, not just with the ban, but in terms of your involvement as the cooperative as in matters that I concern fisheries on the national the level. Fish and about the scarcity of fish. I've been thinking to myself, I, I, I miss when I used to catch an abundance of fish in my nets. I would take it to the market and I would always see and I would always have my customers that didn't have much money. They would come in there and I, I know who they are and they know they don't have. They would ask for one jack. A jack would be like $2. And I know. I would always throw in some free, or sometimes I, I'd see a little old lady coming in. She doesn't have much, and I would always tell her, you know, here you go. You can have that for $3, and it's enough to feed her for maybe two or three days. I, I don't even have enough fish in my house right now for myself. Like I said, I'm setting the nets illegally and hoping that I'm able to pick them up in the morning. Those days are long gone. I have people asking me on the street, do you have fish? Do you have fish? There is no fish. 
if there's so much fish, if Oceana did such a great job, why are people begging me to put their name on a list to give them fish? Um, I'm over here looking at this new government, the PUP. I'm thinking of Figueroa, UDP. I, I'm wondering how he sleeps at night. I mean, he just screwed a whole bunch of fishermen, put a bunch of fishermen in his crimin made, made a bunch of fishermen into criminals, made a bunch of us even more poor than we were. Is he sleeping good at night? I mean, is his paycheck coming in? Is he is? I mean, does it does he is his refrigerator well stocked? I mean, is his pantry full? Because I, I usually buy by the week, so I know my pantry is not full. I mean, is his paycheck is his bank account nice and fat? Is he sleeping well? Because the rest of us out here, because of that one stroke of his pen, we're all criminals now. And Oceana is not helping. Oceana has basically hijacked our country. The new government that's in, a lot of people tell me, don't put any trust in them. They're just the same as the other ones. But you know what? I'm hoping, I'm praying that this new government will see the light and see that there are a lot of people, honest, sincere people who don't want to be begging for food. I'm putting a lot of trust in this new government that they will help us, that they will see the light, that they will do things good for this country, that they will bring this country back to a time of prosperity. They will do something right. And I'm putting a lot of trust in this new government, even though my friends are telling me that they're just here to use us, they're just here to get what they can get. I'm really trusting this government to see what they'll do for us. Listen, in America, in, in, in Canada, and all these countries, these people use Gilnet. So why are we allowing these people to come with ideas telling us that Gilnet is bad and destructive and we're not supposed to use it? I mean, we have to understand, Belizean people, 75%, um, maybe 80% of whatever revenue that is generated from tourism does not stay, doesn't even come to Belize. Because these people have their account in the U.S., in Europe, and they pay. Uh, everything is paid before they even come on board, before they even get in that ship or that plane. So why are we being fooled? Why are we being so ignorant to, 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 to not stop and think? We got to be critical thinkers. We are being brainwashed, and we, need to un we all need to understand as Belizean, we need to stick together. Fishing industry is food security for this country. This vaccine have proved it, you know, and um, there was a scarcity of chicken, right? And the only reason we have a, we had a scarcity of fish is because they have took away one of the most important gears that put fish at the market or at the table and money for many in their people's homes and pack it. So we need to, to, to stop, be deceived or stop listening or believe everything you hear that comes from, from these NGOs. You have an NGO in your community, just stop and think. Show me a community that is prosperous where NGO presence are. Show me a community and I could basically maybe reform or, or, or change my mentality. But I, I could show you where complete communities have been wiped out as soon as NGOs come and settle in. Since the ban came into being, fishers have been taken I'll, I'll use a term that they would use, a licking. Um, they weren't able to make their money to sustain their families since um, November of 2020. When it came on to the Lenten season, this is one time Belizeans can verily, uh, readily say that they weren't able to get fish. They had to eat some said they're going to eat bully beef. That's the, the corned beef for, for Good Friday. No? There was no fish in the markets down south. And I have documents, I have pictures to prove that in Dangriga and in PG, there was no fish in that area. Fishers weren't able to fish with their gillness to bring fish in to help the Belizean people in their tradition for their Good Friday fried fish. Um, the, the lower class of people, if I put that, the lower income people, are the ones who depend on fish that are caught by gillnets. For example, the crevales, the, the, what is called the jacks, the um, mackerels, barracudas, and others that we catch in that. So drummers and other things like that. So they were deprived that opportunity where they can buy a pound of fish. For, for example, a mackerel, 
two pounds would cost a housewife, a single mother, maybe about ten dollars. And if she maybe argue with the fisherman, get it for, for, for maybe nine dollars. She can take that home and she can get maybe eleven to twelve sizes from that fish because a mark is a long fish, she can cut it in small pieces and feed her family, maybe have six hungry um, children or siblings can be fed from that and they'll have a healthy and nutritional, nutritious meal. So they now are being denied that and it continues because people are still not getting fish. I mean they, they're at the market and they walk with their bag and they just shake it when they see snapper for $15 a pound. There is no way they can afford that. So the gillnet need to get back because it is a fair uh, gear that can be used. It's not the structure of ocean has been um, claiming without any kind of um, proof to that. The FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, had rated Gilnet as a favorable gear, 5.9 out of, 5.4 out of 10. So it's a damn good gear. They recommend that we use Gilnets. So um, for people, the small, lower income of people, it is a problem for them now. They cannot buy fish. So that will be one of the items from off their menu. They won't be able to eat fish anymore because they cannot pay $15 a pound for snappers. Imagine a single mother working in Belize and taking home fat one forty-five per week. She cannot buy mac um, snappers. She used to go to the market and buy a two-pound mackerel, yes, for $10, and feed her family for a day. So this is the benefit and the um, thanks, like what my friend said, of Oceana, helping the Belizean nation, living us, help us live in hell. Following the interview, I reached out to an Oceana representative for comments in response to what the fishers shared with me. They decided not to due to the present lawsuit they face. Thanks again to the fishers from the Belize Fishermen's Cooperative for joining today's episode, and to Kyla Gentle for her poem. Please stick around to the end of the episode for another piece from her. Next week, we'll be doing an episode on forest fires, an increasing threat to Belize's forests, along with an interview with Mr. Mario Muschamp, someone many consider one of the foremost experts of forest fire management in Belize. If you like the show, please consider writing a review for us over on Apple Podcasts, as it helps to increase the show's visibility. If you write a five-star review, we will read it in a future episode. If you have a climate crisis or environmental story impacting Belize you'd like to discuss, you can contact us at madafyah at gmail.com or message us on Facebook and Twitter at Madafaya, and be sure to hit that follow button. We encourage you to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to the podcast so you can hear all of the other episodes that we have upcoming in the next few weeks. Thanks to Alexander Evans for providing our theme song. You can provide him on Instagram at Alexander Evans Music. And thanks to Demi Williams for providing our artwork. And thanks to you for listening to Marafaya. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode. And remember, climate change is real and collective effort is needed to save our home. We wish for you greater resilience, peace, and moments of quiet. To those that have stepped through the revolving doors of the life that this soul has made a home out of. To those that have stepped through those doors only to take a glance and then leave without a thank you or goodbye, I appreciate your very brief time. To those that have come and looked around and found themselves resonating with the interior decor, those who decided to make themselves at home, please stay as long as you like. Your presence is welcome. And if you ever tire and choose to pack up and leave, I know I cannot stop you. To those that were evicted, whatever the reason may be, I'm sorry we had to part ways. I know you found plenty of homes that provide for you in ways that I could not. And to those who came and stayed a while, but scratched up my flooring, ripped down my curtains, and then left without closing the gate behind you, without taking a second glance back at the doors hanging from their hinges or at the furniture strewn about, I say thank you. Because if it were not for you, I would have never known what it means to rebuild. I would have never known how to take up hammer and nail and mend the broken windows, to pick up bucket and brush and repaint the peeling walls. I would have never known how to shed a couple tears, varnish the furniture and then move on. And so I say thank you. I do hope you enjoyed your stay.